Well, this part of the surface is very much for everyone, but it's particularly for tribe and flame. So if you're in tribe or flame, do come and sit and listen to this bit of our meeting together. So we've been thinking, haven't we, about this greatest source of power known to us, which is prayer, which is praying to the God of heaven. And we've been looking at the life of someone who found out about this greatest source of power. And her name was Gladys Aylwood. She was born in North London. Um, and when she was 12, she left school and became a maid. And we know that in the 1920s, as a teenager, she turned away from God. But when she was 19, she turned back to God. And she said that at the meeting she went to, she said in that church, I found Jesus Christ. She found a relationship and this this um, encounter that she had with God was so powerful that she decided to give her whole life to do something for God. Um, and she wanted to go out to China, but she was turned down, wasn't she, by one of the, the biggest of the missionary societies. And she wasn't able to go because she, they said she couldn't learn the language. But in her heart, she felt, I still feel God wants me to go to China. She returned to London and became um, a servant again, working in a house. Here's this wonderful picture that we found of her. And she began to save up and she prayed that amazing prayer. Uh, Lord, I have here two and a half pence, my Bible, my reading notes, but I've got you, Lord. Please, could you take me to China? And also we know that um, at that time, uh, far out in the sort of mountain region in the northern part of China, another woman was praying and her name was Jeannie Lawson. She was 73 years old. She was a, a widow and a missionary and she was praying, oh Lord, would you send someone out from England who could come and who could help me? And so they, they got in contact act somehow and it was agreed Gladys would go out and so she tries to work out the cheapest way of getting out there and she discovers that for 47 pounds she can travel all the way across Europe look at the map right the way across to China um, but she's told it's risky at the best of times and there's a war at the moment and she says I'll take the risk God is with me and on October the 15th 1932 she leaves from Liverpool Street Station do you remember she has her food and her little stove in her case and she's got secret compartments that her mother had sewn into her fur coat with her passport um, and her other papers and she heads out and on that train um, in Europe she meets a couple and the woman says to her Gladys Aylwood she said for the rest of my life I'm going to pray for you each evening and as they leave her in Holland uh, when they get off in Holland the man gives her uh, a one pound note and so she heads out across Europe, Eastern Europe alone. She goes through these crowded stations in Russia and out on into the mountainous snowy area of Siberia, which is very desolate and remote. But in the distance, they can hear gunfire and they can hear the sounds of war. And then a guard comes onto the train, doesn't he? And he says to them, you're all going to have to get off. But she doesn't want to get off. And in the end, she ends up at a station in a train where all the lights have been turned off. And she's the only person on the train. And she thinks she's the only person in the station. She then finds the men from the railway there. And they say to her, you can't go on. You've got to go back. And she says, I can't go back. And they said, yes, you've got to go back. You're going to have to walk. And so she sets off on that long journey, a whole night and a whole day she sleeps for part of it she's walking through those dark woods she's walking near the tracks there's snow in the distance she can hear wolves howling and I wonder what she was doing in her mind was she turning towards God was she was she thinking well God I've come out here to do this for you what is happening to me where are you or did she remember what the Bible says in the day of trouble in the day of trial don't harden your heart God was preparing her for other times when she would have to trust him. What that verse says is when it's difficult, don't turn away from him. So often when things are difficult in our life, we turn away and we think, well, you don't really care about me. I'll sort this out myself. But did she turn towards him in her heart as she walked along? I think she probably did. And in the end, you remember, she arrives exhausted with the last bit of her strength. She drags herself up onto the platform of that Russian station and... 
Instead of getting a welcome or some help, she gets arrested by the Russian officials. And she's put in this desperate, dark situation um, in this cell where there's not much light. There are other people there. Um, it's very, very dirty and grim. Um, and she said, I prayed desperately to God at that time. And they'd taken, the Russian officials had taken all her things, hadn't they? And she just had her little pocket note, uh, little pocket Bible with her. And out of her Bible falls this printed piece of paper. And she can just read out the, the read the words because it's written in big bold print and it said don't be afraid of them for I am with you Gladys Aylward don't be afraid of them for I am with you and she felt it was a message direct from God and they held her there for about two days and two nights and during that time she must have kept thinking about that verse don't be afraid of them I'm with you and then they find in her things as they're going through them uh, a picture of her brother and he's in army uniform it was like an army band uniform and so they they sort of change their mind about her and they think well maybe she's someone quite important we better be a bit careful here so they give her back all her stuff they bring her out of the prison um, and they put her on a train um, and after some toings and froings, she ends up on this trans-siberian railroad look at this this is an amazing original picture of of that trans-siberian Siberian um, train at that time um, and this train is going to take her all the way across look at this map to a city right far out in the east called Vladivostok it's the farthest bit of Russia so she's actually by the time she gets there she's gone right past China she's gone right up to the north and she's gone right past China and she's there alone in Vladivostok and again, she gets arrested by the Russian officials. Then they say to her, we've looked at your papers and stuff. They got an interpreter. And we think you're, we don't think you're a missionary. We think it says you're a machinist. You, you, you know how to run machines and things. We need to keep you here. So they took away her passport, but they put her into a hotel, which was in one way amazing provision for her because she was able to, to wash and to sleep in a bed. Um, and, and it was much better conditions than she'd been in before but it was a bit sinister that they'd taken her passport because she knew she couldn't leave and then the man comes after a couple of days and he holds up her passport and and he says you can't leave without this and she just reached out she grabbed it and she threw it into the hotel room behind her and she said I don't know if you believe in God but God is with me and you can't take my passport back and for some reason, he didn't even try and take it back. And then to cut a long story short, a young woman and an older man helped to rescue her. She never knew who they were. She didn't know why they helped her, but God must have sent them. And she ends up down in the dock area of Vladivostok. And the woman says to her, there's only one way out of this to escape from the, the, the Russian communists. You're going to have to get on one of the boats that's going out to Japan. And, and, and Gladys Able said, but I've got no money. She said, I, I haven't got anything with me. She, and, and the woman said, well, just ask the, the Japanese captain. And he said, I'll take you so long as you agree to be our prisoner. Then we can take you in an official capacity over to Japan. So she agreed. And just as they were on the gangplank, which is the ramp leading up to the boat, um, someone called and she looked and the Russian soldiers were running towards her. So she threw her stuff up onto the boat and they grabbed hold of her coat um the russian soldiers and and someone shouted to give give them what you've what you've got and she thought i've got nothing to give them and then she remembered the pound note and she pulled it out and handed it to them and and they were distracted they grabbed the pound note and the japanese men pulled her over into the boat pulled up the gangplank and then they headed off towards japan what a what an extraordinary situation how amazing that that pound note came in useful at that point so she travels across to japan again going further east than china is and she reaches the missionaries the christian missionaries in japan in a city called kobe um, and there they care for her they help her and they get her to a boat that's going to china a steamer ship so now she's on a steamer ship going back west towards china and then on November the 8th, 1932, the captain calls her to the bridge of the ship, the bit where you look out ahead. And he pointed out, he, he, he said, Miss Ale would out into the distance. He said, you'll see China. And she wrote this, away on the horizon, across a muddy yellow sea, I saw China at last. How amazing. And so she arrives in the city of Tianjin in China, 
um, and the Christians gather around her. She finds them in the mission hall. They gather around her. They can hardly believe the story she's telling. And then they say, we've got our meeting now. Come to our meeting. So she's swept up, goes into the meeting. And at the beginning of the meeting, they stand and they sing, praise my soul, the king of heaven, to his feet my tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like me his praise should sing, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting king. She said she sang it as she had never sung it in her life before. And then Mrs. Lawson had sent to Tien Sin, Mr. Lu, who was going to escort her up to Yang Cheng. That last part of the journey took several days. Uh, they went on crowded trains and mountain buses that clung to tiny mountain roads. And then the last two days, she had to travel on this. She had to travel on a donkey, on a mule. And they went past lakes and valleys and mountains. She said, I thought I'd be broken into little pieces on that mule. She went in one of these mule trains where they travel together. And so late in November 1932, five and a half weeks after a most gruelling and dangerous journey, she arrives in Yang Chen. And there at the gate tray, which opened onto a derelict-looking courtyard, stood Mrs. Jeanie Lawson. And she says to her, who are you? And Gladys Aylwood says, I'm Gladys Aylwood. I've come from London. Oh, yes, Mrs. Lawson said. Well, are you, are you coming in? And Gladys Aylwood said she had an almost irresistible desire to burst into sort of hysterical laughter. She was so tired, so worn out, and it was such a low-key kind of welcome. But in she went. God had got her to China. He'd brought her safely to China at last. It was nothing short of a miracle. That night she knelt by her bed to thank him because of what he'd done. She didn't know that actually the real adventures were just beginning. Let's pray. Oh God, we worship you. Uh, we praise you, King of Heaven, like Gladys Aylwood praised you uh, on that day when she reached that city. We praise you that you're with us in the difficulties, uh, that you're with us and you keep us safe on our journeys uh, and on our journey through life, Lord. Um, and we lift up our eyes and we worship you, Lord, today. Uh, and we bless you and we pray you'd help us, Lord, to understand some of the things that Gladys Aylwood was beginning to understand about trusting you. Amen. Amen. <laughs>